we're going to have a nice little discussion here. We don't have a great deal of time, and you've already met them in the movie, so I'm just going to uh, ask to come to the stage the director of the movie, Lonnie Price, and one of the stars, you might say, of the movie, Abby Pogrebin. Did you just stage direct where, where she was going to sit? I do whatever he tells me. <laughs> we were married in the show. I was going to ask yeah. about that. How did the marriage Although turn out? Although our parts are very divergent in, in, in <laughs> size. <laughs> uh, a few filmmaking questions first for you, Abby. No, uh, for you, Lonnie. Um, I'm still astonished to learn the third time I've seen this now. Uh, that you began making this film without having that footage. Yeah. So my question is A, uh, what, was I thinking? what was it going to be? Yeah, what, what, <laughs> what were you thinking? What was it going to be? And B, how was it found? Was it, is it in that Secaucus storeroom where all of Gershwin is? No, no, no. Um, I, I made it, we were gonna use a lot of the, the footage that was shot in a balcony. You know, I was just sort of gonna put it together. I had always known that the footage existed and um, we, had, we actually hired somebody to find it. There are these guys who find footage. And um, the, the, he, uh, this great man, John Miller Monzon, and he said to me, there's a 9% chance it exists. <laughs> that, was not, that was not heartening at the time. But um, Bruce uh, you know, hired him, and um, I always knew it was there. I, I had this odd thing where I just thought, they didn't throw that away. I cannot believe anyone threw that footage away. And interestingly enough, is it's, it was at ABC Archives. It wound up being in a mountain in Connecticut, you know, like buried. <laughs> but we typed in, it was uh, Broadway, Merrily, Alvin Theater, Hal, Steve, musical, nothing. And they went back and went back and they went back one more time and someone typed in B-Way, B apostrophe <laughs> W-A-Y, and 37 boxes of film popped up on the screen. It was extraordinary. And the day they called me and they said, I think we got it. And that's why you can see me looking really chic watching the film. I'm like <laughs> unshowered and like, you know, who would have thought? Uh, but I was, it was, you know, that was like the holy grail for us. And uh, I don't know what it would have been, but um, I just was compelled to make it. And then we just got lucky and found it. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, the whole climax of the film is uh, you, the moment when you're told that you are in the cast and imagining this film without that moment. I mean, I'm sure it would have been a good film too, but... Um, uh. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll pass on that. Uh, but one more specifically filmmaking question. W can you explain in any way the Jason Alexander toupee continuity <laughs> issue? I was so scared you'd ask that. Um, <laughs> He's you, not you here, will, by the way. You will have to ask Jay th that. Well, I mean, I, I'll tell you. I mean, he is, you know, very determined that people not see him as George Costanza, and uh, so he wanted. You know, it was a pure. You know, he, we filmed that. You know, his stuff maybe what three years ago, Kit, something like that, and uh, he wanted people to start seeing him differently. Yeah. And uh, it's the consistency that's the problem. I don't <laughs> think it's the. No, know, I, that that's my point. Yeah. Um, Abby, uh, since the uh, time you were in uh, Merrily We Roll Along, you've, you've become yourself a uh, nonfiction uh, journalist and have been on the other side of the camera a lot. So my first question to you is when Lonnie must have come to you at some point, uh, did you have any questions and qualms about being part of the documentary? I mean, I, I did, oh, I, look, I love Lonnie and trust him implicitly, but I, I feel a little bit sometimes embarrassed about our unique intimacy of this cast. That if you don't, if you're not in it, you mm -hmm. could almost say, this is a little dysfunctional, that you all <laughs> are still so loving of each other. And, you know, we shouldn't misrepresent. It's not like we're hanging out all the time. But every time there's been a production of Merrily, we kind of show up. <laughs> and <laughs> someone could say that's just a little bit odd, you know, let go, let go of it. Um, so I guess I just didn't want to, and, and in some ways, you know, I, I was in the ensemble and, and, you know, Lonnie almost generously cuts out. I know I, I talked to him about how my, my part just got sliced down and down and down. I mean, 
I didn't get fired, but as they tried to focus the three characters, all the ensemble, we all had stories. I had 10 costume changes, if I could tell you. I had boas and feathers and heels and all of it gone, you know? So when Annie says, you know, that was a mistake, we were like dying for our costumes and suddenly we were in these t-shirts and <laughs> with, you know, signs on them. So it was, it's a long way of saying I was also felt a little bit embarrassed about how my part had gotten very small in the end. I was still married, I was married to Charlie, um, but, I didn't want it to seem as if I was kind of overliving this experience, even though, as you can see, for all of us, it was this pivotal touchstone that's undeniable. Well, well let's talk about that pivotal touchstone aspect. Uh, you all had a trauma at an early age that a lot of other people get in showbiz a bit later. Certainly, especially you. You were the youngest yeah. in the cast, as we heard. Yeah. Um, and. I wonder if there's any way in which that turned out to the good for either of you, teaching you something early on. I think you speak to this in the movie, um, but Lonnie as well, that other people spend you know, another 10, 20 years struggling with before they sort of reorient their lives to something that's going to work better for them. You know, well, I, I, you know I, I, um, I'm a little weird about it. I mean, it was very disappointing, obviously, just because I wanted to keep doing it. I just loved doing it. And so, but I oddly never felt wounded by it because I was so proud of it and getting to do it. And, you know, from that kid in New Jersey to get Stephen Sondheim songs and, I mean, are you kidding? It was such a gift that it was hard to ever think. Um, I mean, the closing was terrible and that was very sad and I was very depressed. But, um, to have not done it at all, or I mean, it, it, it never it never felt to me like I paid a great price for um, for its demise, its early demise. So I don't know, Abby. Maybe you, I, I don't know that I learned anything, mm -hmm. but I just was so grateful um, to have gotten the opportunity to be in it. Really, a Abby, do you feel that it did? Oh, I think I learned a ton, yeah. and I think it was um, you know slap in the face, and and not. Like I, you know, I went back to school. <laughs> I mean, I went back to class. So in a way, that was a refuge to go be able to, be able to go back to my sort of normal life and, you know, uh, in high school. I think what, what and it was, it was Lonnie coming back to us and talking to us about this that made me realize that, and he sets it up so well in the, in the film, it's hard to imagine the expectation level of this. But at the, it was, you know, Hal and Steve were at their peak. And for those of us who had grown up obsessed with them, there was no real possibility of failure. Right. So delus disillu disillusionment is a cliche by now, and, and so is idealism, but those were very real kind of um, earth-shattering thing, revelations for me to be 16, not even think of the possibility of failure, and see that failure is not, not doesn't just happen, it can be very fast. And there is no saving it. Like I kept thinking like, where is the cavalry here? We're, are we literally done? And we were just done. Did you, you mentioned that you, uh, for a little while, you tr went on auditions and things like that. How yeah. long did that last? Did you, were you pretty quickly out of there? You know, I was, um, I did it in college, and you know, whenever I would walk into an audition, everybody would start playing the dun, 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 <laughs> you know? Um, and, and you can hear in my voice, I used to have a belt, you know, I didn't have a trained voice, but I got parts in, in college, so I sort of was affirmed in my fantasy for a while. Um, and it was really once I graduated and thought I was gonna be doing it, that the merrily kind of feeling and awareness came back to me. Um, and you know, it, it is hard, because I have, I have two kids, and one of them is very much a performer, and it's tricky. It's tricky for me to find myself not encouraging him the, se the way, as full-throated in as full -throated a way as I might have if I had not had this experience. Mm, maybe Frank had something partly right. I mean, go, go make money and, and... Yeah, you know, I mean, you say in the movies, uh, you know, uh, people's, people don't necessarily get what they deserve in America. It's not a meritocracy, and you wouldn't want people to dream too big. That sounds a lot like Frank at the beginning of the first version of the show, anyway. Um, but but I want to talk about something else. The, a couple people in the movie mention feeling that they uh, betrayed the show, or not betrayed exactly, but that uh, that somehow the show's failure was owing to something they didn't do. Well, there, there was, I mean, you know, the critical response was 
quite hostile and um, and hostile to the cast. I mean, you know, Frank Rich singled out a few of us and said the rest were dead wood. Um, <laughs> that's that's a heavy thing to carry uh, when you're 20 or 19 or, you know, it was it was devastating. You know, a- and also, you know, I'd worked for Hal in his office on Pacific Overtures, and they ran that six months, and I thought, well, they'll yeah, certainly right. run six months. I mean, you know, it was the rug was pulled out from under us in a very a very hard way. Um, that was that was shocking. And, and last night at the screening at Alice Tully, afterward, we, uh, I spoke to Stephen Sondheim, and he said that he felt that he had betrayed the show and the young cast by pushing you all out of a window before you were fully fledged. And he he started to cry on yeah. stage about this, which was shocking. Uh, did did you at the time have that uh, feeling? Uh, Hal Hal has always felt incredibly. Uh, incredibly guilty, and he would tell you that if he were sitting here. I do remember he came to my dressing room, uh, I think the night before we closed, and he said, uh, I'm sorry I didn't give you a hit. He said, I think I gave you a good show, but I didn't give you a hit, and I really wanted to. And um, he's he's still like that. And don't forget Daisy, his daughter. I mean, that, I mean, Lonnie couldn't get into that psychodrama, and right. they're so close, and I mean, and they obviously their relationship didn't suffer, but what a feeling for a father to be giving her this extraordinary gift and then taking it away, essentially. You, you see the moment of that gift in, in, the, uh, uh, the in, the, in that scene. It's incredible, oh, the look on his her. face, oh, just incredible. gorgeous. Uh, but that brings up an interesting point that I've always been interested in, and granted, my interest is based on a smaller sampling than either of you have of shows. I, I was Hal Prince's apprentice in the immediately next flop, <gasps> um, uh, the flop about which Ryan no one will Dolls ever Life. make a documentary. Doll's Life? A, a Doll's Life. Um, and w- what I noticed then, and I want to ask each of you if, if it was true in the case of Merrill Lee, is there's a kind of Stockholm Syndrome that sets in uh, among the cast, or some kind of uh, psychopathology where you really cannot see outside the box. You're, you're so captivated by... <laughs> You're captivated. You are. You have captors. It's the material and the company that you can't. You identify with it to such a strong degree. You couldn't possibly see. Well, listen to that score. I mean, you couldn't. Po- I mean, those songs were so. And amazing. you knew that. You knew that then. Oh God. Yeah, it was so. In, it was so undeniable. Well, but, but but it's interesting because a lot of times you think, well, you don't know that. Then it's only later when we get used to these shows, and certainly the public took a long time coming around yeah, to it. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I remember the first time I heard, I mean, after Sweeney Todd, for him to be writing these primary color Julie Stein songs that were so amazing, I mean, you can't you listen to opening doors or any of that, or our time, and not go, oh my God, listen to that song. You know, so we, I think we felt so strongly about that score, and the book changed all the time, we sort of we thought, all right, it's getting better, and they did what Steve said last night. They did phenomenal work in five weeks. I mean, the amount of rewriting and clarifying, and interestingly enough, what you were talking about in terms of them focusing the movie, I wanted it to be about all of us. And I interviewed a lot of people and finally realized, like they did 35 years ago, you can only really focus on <laughs> five people. Oh, no, did you have to cut some of the same people? <laughs> it wasn't that bad. Oh, my God. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> Twice in one lifetime. It wasn't that bad, but but there was a lot of a lot of other people. But but the work they did as a director now was um, really extraordinary, and the amount that they threw at us. I mean, Franklin Shepard Inc. I mean, Char- Charlie, Lonnie learned that like how close to that opening. was a late edition. That was a very late edition. We went edition. through five weeks of preview, five weeks of rehearsal, saying, "And Lonnie sings a song here," <laughs> and move on. And um, I got this is really true. Abby remembers it, but I got the first third two days before the first preview second, third, and then the last third, I think the day before the dress rehearsal, and... Um, One of the most complicated, you know, past... But well, when you're 22 yeah, or 20, you, can you know, do you anything. can do... But also, you got the best tailor in the world making you a suit. So, right. I have three good notes, and he just kept hitting them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I was good with a lot of words, and he gave me a lot of words. I mean... It was. It fit so brilliantly on everything I was ever good at that it wasn't as hard. Other actors who do go, how did you learn that? And for me, it really was. You know, he he just knew what I did well, and he just showed showed it off. So I just got really lucky. 
uh, Abby, do, could you, from inside the bubble, see anything that uh, uh, was going wrong or that... Did you ever say, I don't think you know, so? If I'm honest about it, um, you know, and, and Steve gave a, a major sh shout out to George Firth last night, and he deserves it. You know, he wrote Company, I'm a huge fan. But I feel like the script, which has been the thing that's changed the most since in its incarnations, there was some something that I don't think my 16 year old self could put my finger on, but it just, it didn't feel. And I feel like I was unfair to Jim in the interview when saying that he wasn't fluid because I have a great affection for him. But it was sort of like that. It was like the somehow the language wasn't as fluid as the music. Mm -hmm. It was holding us up in some way, catching us almost. Um, and th I had some, I have some memory of that. It's almost like a physical memory of like, uh, why isn't this yeah. quite working? And But also as Lonnie. Steve has said, and, and, and it's really true, they, did, they have done so much work on it since. And it really is, an, uh, it's a very different show. Well, I was going to ask, have you either or both of you seen many of the iterations? You said that you go as a pack or something. <laughs> it's kind of pathetic. Um, <laughs> you don't go that often no, as well, a pack. Maybe I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so have you seen uh, several of the later yeah, incarnations? And, yeah. and, and are they improvements? Sure. I mean, you know, they've they've worked incredibly hard, and the show is wildly successful now, wherever it plays. Well, is it successful because the score is now undeniable, or is mm -hmm. is the book has the book really come up to the level of the I score? I think they I think they did great work on it, and I think it's much more accessible to an audience. And um, yeah, no, I th I think it's much improved. And you know, it was the first version of it. You know, it was the first time, and. Um, you know, the notion of kids and, and, and all of that. Um, you know, Steve was saying last night, you know, a, a $60 top ticket, it was $35. And, you know, audiences came and they saw what they wanted was raw. And they were charmed by that rawness. The Broadway audience was not. And so um, they amended it and made the characters older and stuff like that. And that, that helped the audience like it better. And then the new songs and all that. I mean, so yeah, I think they, I think they've done a great job. And I would, I would just add, and you were getting at it last night when you talked to Steve, that I learned also watching him since the Merrily closing, revisit, go back, go back to a failure. I, I think just as you know, someone who is a journalist and has trouble myself going back to something that I didn't think that I think didn't work. There's something to me heroic in how much Steve has tended this material. You know, he just keeps going back, and, and the fact that he was there for the reunion, I was like, doesn't Steve have better things to do than, you know, be with some old, you know, most of us are unfamous, a few, a few of them are, but he just tends this show. He tends, I'm sure, all his work the same way, but I, I think that's been a huge lesson for me. You go back, you don't say this is all it can be. I, I do think this material has special meaning to him in addition to everything else in part reflecting his own youth in the theater, as he's often talked about, with Hal and Mary, Mary Rogers and all of those things. But um, also I think if you've got a score like that, I mean, I keep going back to that, but it, it's really one of the great pieces of music in the, in the American musical theater, and you've got to get it in a setting where you'll be able to continue to hear it that way. But the, I want to ask you, have either of you considered wanting to perform in it again? I guess this is more for Lonnie because no, I'm done. I'm I'm, in, I'm retired. <laughs> I'm in recovery. I say I, I do not. I don't perform anymore. I, it's, I'm terrified of it. And actually. if someone said, "Please, we want you to direct the show," you said you haven't. It's the one show you haven't done. I, I kind of think what you just saw is, is what, my statement on it. I, yeah. I I don't know that I would. I think I'm too close to it, and I'm not sure. There's too many ghosts. I don't think that I'd be very good for it, frankly. So this is as close as I think I'm going to get to it. Um, and a Abby, do you know all your lines and songs and parts? Well, my lines still? disappeared, okay. Jesse. But, okay, but, but, but you, you might wanna, still know them. If you just want to bring it up. You and sit in a dark room I'll pay for more reciting therapy. your lines. <laughs> <laughs> Abby, do the, do the, do the, do the, no, the last I can't, line. I can't. That's an awful thing to make me do. <laughs> Wait, what, what was the last so line? The, the, when they, they, they showed the first reading that we ever did, it was on the Evita stage. Oh, great. That's not imposing No, that's all. not imposing. And it was a rake stage. So not only were you a vertigo emotionally, <laughs> you literally did. And I had one, like two lines, I mean, there was sort of two pockets where Evelyn showed up. 
And I, I just killed it. I just want you guys to know, I killed it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was never that funny again. But I know that's part of why I got the part. I mean, I'm realistic now. I'm old enough. I have to be truthful. And I have had a lot of therapy. So, <laughs> um, so I guess when I revisit this, it's you know in the shower and it's in the car and with it, my kids. They you know they did it at my kids' school two oh, years you're ago. Kidding. No, they did the production. My children were not in it. Okay. But but that's where and I become like one of those crazy old people going. You know I remember. <laughs> um, but it's a, it does live on. Do they know? believe you that you were in it? I you mean, know, I, I think I think they're uh, they look you know at least I'm on the album at least my my name is there. Uh, I yeah, don't mine carry is around on a Doll's Life's album. Yeah. Well. <laughs> 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 and I'm getting the signal that we are out of time. Thank you so much, Abby Pogrevin and Lonnie Price. <laughs>